let's face it, there are times where life is a mess. Seasons where it seems like things are changing by the hour and each of those changes kicks new plans into place or adaptations into effect. The messes that we face might be personal and it might be global. No matter if it's just a leaking sink or a global pandemic, the way that we deal with these messes is varied. A lot of the way that we deal with these things has to do with our past experience or our current circumstances and our vision of what the future holds for us. And thanks to these factors, each and every one of us handles our messes of life a little bit differently. However, as we begin a new teaching series this week, my hope and prayer is that we're able to create some space in the mess to give you some tools to more clearly see God within the chaos that surrounds us when life gets messy. Because I fully believe that God will often work most powerfully in our lives when we encounter the holy in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the storm. You know, Messes oftentimes come in different kinds of seasons, right? Like sometimes there are seasons of need or, or loss, seasons of boldness or disillusionment, isolation, and others. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to begin to take some, some hard looks at these different seasons with a man who has seen God in all of these seasons and come through them faithfully. It's the prophet Elijah, one of the cornerstones of the, the Hebrew Bible and holds a special place in the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian traditions. Elijah had a really high mountaintop experiences in his life, but he also had some lows that would rival any of our messes. Elijah's been there, he's done that. And so I think we can learn a lot from him. Elijah is a hero of the faith. He's one of the two people who was never never seen as dying in the Bible. He was a guy who was standing with Moses when Jesus was transfigured in the Gospels on the mountaintop. He has powerful stories of faith, and so you would think that, that this guy's introduction to the audience through the scripture will be something of like a WWE entrance or a football team bursting onto the field to huge fanfare. However, it's not how it happened. Just the opposite, really. But before we get into that, before we go too much further, I want to think a little bit about the orientation of where we are in our story and in the life of God's people in or before we kind of get down to business today. Okay, so Elijah was a prophet, someone who spoke for God in the 9th century BCE. He lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which will be important geography later, not the southern kingdom where the temple in Jerusalem were. And the king at the time was Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who also plays a part in our story. Now, most of what Elijah has been tasked with was to call the people of God back to worshiping God. They had gotten sidetracked with the worship of other gods because of you know, some of the shortcuts that they were trying to make, in particular, the god Baal. Jezebel and Baal and the king all become kind of a convenient villain for our story. But one of the questions we also have to ask is, why did God's people lose their way? Part of it had to do with the fact that they were in the north and it was a really long way to go down to the temple to worship. It was inconvenient. Nobody wanted to make the trip. And so they made use of closer altars to worship Yahweh. But then they started to hang around those altars. Then they started to spend more time there. Then they started to say, well, why not this God too? And that's not really a good look for a people who have committed to having no other God but God, right? We're introduced to Elijah after a little oasis had dried up and the ravens who had brought him food stopped doing so. That's right, ravens were feeding him at this little oasis. And so he was alone and starving, crying out to God in a, se a season of serious need. And God answered and said, get up and find this widow who will nurse you back to health and get you food. It's not a real heroic start to a guy who we we admire his his faith, right? And so in a time of drought and famine, Elijah is called to depend on someone, the widow, who is already dependent on others for help and sustenance. Even when he meets this woman, she's preparing her last meal, gathering sticks to make bread one final time. Elijah's in a mess. He's in a season of deep need. 
And what we see through this passage of scripture is that need is not a failure or a setback, but it's a chance to grow in a way that we can only understand if we live through it. There's some things that we just have to live through. Seasons of deep need are some of the places where God works best, though, because there's no doubt who is in charge or at work. So clear, in fact, that our pride won't even try to take credit for what God is up to, because when it's happening, it is so clear. Now, friends, to be honest, I don't know that my pride would have let me do what Elijah's faith empowered him to do. And that's ask for help in a season of deep need. I'm terrible at it. When I was in high school, we had a Spanish teacher who played this game called Ayudame. And basically, we were divided into teams and uh, you would go up to the board and when it was your turn, she would ask a series of questions and the first team to get all the questions right in this kind of relay race style would win. And if you didn't know the answer, you would just have to tap your marker on the board before you wrote the answer down and say Ayudame or help me in Spanish. Now, two things that are not on the top of my spiritual gifts list are Spanish and spelling. They're actually two of my weaker points. We would say growing edges, right? And terrible. But I would try my hardest and I would stand at that board longer than I probably should have because I hated asking my teammates for help. I hated it. Ah, oh, still flashbacks. But maybe that's the lesson that God has for Elijah and for us today. When you're in a season of need, Remember, you weren't made to do life alone. Reliance on others is learned the hard way, right? Like we can know in our head that, but, but at the same time, we have to live it because from my experience, our pride gets in the way of accepting help from others readily. And so at the end of the day, our need and Elijah's need to do some powerful things can be learned through this story because it really sets us up to see God in the midst of these seasons of need. And so the first thing that it does when we you know, recognize this season of need and see God through it is that it begins to plant the seeds of reliance on others so that we might eventually come to learn that we're able to be more human, even in times of need, when we allow others and God to enter into our lives. Now, one of this, you know, it, it's one thing to, to know that reliance is, is not a bad thing, but it's a whole nother thing then, if that's the first step is to say, I, I know I can rely on people. It's a totally other thing to accept that help that's offered. And so the second thing that we learn from this season of need in, in Elijah's life is that there are times where we must accept that help. <laughs> if somebody from this community says, hey, I'm, I'm here to help because they know you're going through a tough time or even just they want to help support you. I know it's hard sometimes, but take them up on it because it's often a blessing for both of you. For Elijah, the widow would have been the last person he would have asked, but she was exactly the person that could help him. She was just as surprised as he was that the food didn't run out. And, and maybe there's a, a sermon on her faith and trusting God in the future because she fed him before she fed her or her son. Have you ever gotten help from an unlikely source? I know sometimes the best help and the best perspective I've ever gotten was when I'm able to say, yeah, I'll accept that help from the most unlikely of places. So our need allows us to plant the seed for reliance, and it allows us an opportunity to accept the help. And finally, when faced with the season of need, we're able to increase our faith in God. Because encountering the being fed by the widow, um, even though that's so powerful, Elijah would, would need this reminder of God's provision later on for some of the things that were to come. God got him through that season when the ravens didn't come and the water dried up. And then when he is remembering God's faithfulness, there's a growth in his faith. God got him through that season of need and will continue to move in Elijah's life as we'll see in the coming weeks. And so this week, remember, remember, need is not a failure or a setback, but it's a chance to grow in a way that we can only understand when we live through it. If things are hard, write a reminder on a post-it note and stick it onto your wall or, or your mirror and repeat this, this reminder that you know, need is not a setback or a failure, but rather a chance to experience community and God in a new way. Messy and raw, sure, but also good and authentic. 
When life's a mess and you're in a season of need, take some time to see where God is working and know that there is a community right here to help support you, to plant those seeds. And all you have to do is accept the help that is offered. Let's pray. Wonder working God, Psalm 139 reminds us that we can't go anywhere outside of your presence. We know that you're here. We know that you are in this place and in those struggles and in the mess with us. To have a creator, a redeemer, a sustainer that is with us through thick and thin, God is life-giving. Allow us to set our baggage, our pride, our, our egos aside at times, to plant the seed of reliance on others to accept help, and then to see where you have been in our past faithful to those needs that we cry out to you so that we might take on and be faithful with the larger things. God of grace and peace, we pray this in your son's name who entered into the mess and overcame the worst of the messiness that we could throw at him so that we might have life. Amen.